So Esther 2, we turn our attention this morning to the second, for the second installment in our series in this book of the Bible. Esther 2, it's found in your pew Bibles at page 410, if that's helpful. May I remind you of the history behind this little book at this point in history where Esther appears. God's people Israel, our spiritual fathers and mothers, as we've been reminded this morning, they're dispersed geographically. History remembers them at this point as the diaspora. You'll remember going back in history that under the Assyrian Empire, the northern tribes were taken off into captivity. The northern tribes of Israel in 722 B.C. And then later on, Judah, from the southern kingdom, will be swept away and Jerusalem destroyed by the next prominent kingdom, reigning kingdom, the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And this Babylonian captivity was the context for such heroism as is recorded in the Bible, as that of Daniel and his friends Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, better known more famously anyway by their Babylonian names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now that Babylonian empire gave way to, in 539 B.C., to the Persian Empire, whose emperor Cyrus opened the way for the Jews to return to Jerusalem and to the Holy Land. And some took him up on the offer and returned, while many chose instead to stay put. Among the latter were the Jewish characters to whom we're coming this morning, Mordecai and his better known younger cousin Hadassah, more famously remembered by her Persian name, Esther. The history that we're reading this morning takes place some 50 years after the Persians had taken over uh, the Babylonians. Let's pray. Father, we ask for you to open our eyes to see and our ears to hear marvelous things from your law. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Esther 2, after these things. Now, we'll pause there a second. These things uh, being, of course, uh, the glorious and opulent 100-day palace party at Susa, marred by the king's drunken demand that Queen Vashti present herself as a trophy before the men, the drunken crowd, her, her refusal to appear, and the subsequent ill-considered and irrev irrevocable banishment of Vashti. After these things, when the king, the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure, and she was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. 
And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations for women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem in custody of Shaash Gaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again, unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the son of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go in to the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the, eunuch, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in, in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Palinitis! Palinitis! The children cried out on the playground at my grammar school, buzzing around Jenny Palin, like bees around a hive as she exited the doors at recess time, warning everyone on the playground of the dread disease of Palinitis. It was a horribly cruel way that these children, these Christian children, would sometimes be. Jenny, and I've changed her, her name, by the way, Jenny was a very homely, very skinny girl with a prominent overbite and glasses and stringy hair. And alas, she became the target of the ridicule by fellow children on the playground, so insecure in themselves and so anxious for a foil and oh, so superficial. Superficiality was the order of the day in Ahasuerus' Persia and in the city, the citadel of Susa. It is noticeable, even from the opening of the book that we considered last week, isn't it? Ahasuerus' feast had to last 180 days. Well, why? Because it took that long to parade all his riches and his pomp and his splendor and his glory before all the nobles gathered there from the provinces. Now, the show is spoiled, of course, by the refusal of the piece de resistance of Azuharis' collection, the beautiful Queen Vashti, to appear. He wanted to show her off, as the author of this book uh, points out to us. Verse 11, she was lovely to look at. She was Ahasuerus' favorite doll to play with until she wasn't. Apparently, in cold soberness, he does come to regret his drunken decision. 
But even then, when the search was on for a new candidate to replace the deposed queen, what are the basic requirements? Is it a fine character and upstanding? Is it discernment, wisdom, a faithful woman? No. Beautiful and young. Those are the two requirements, twice repeated. Beautiful and young. And how are they prepared for presentation to the king? You know, Persian history classes? You know, studies? Ethics examinations? No. Beauty treatments. A whole year of cosmetic conditioning. What is becoming uh, apparent here is that Persian culture was all about the superficial. You know, men were measured by the size of their wallets and women by the size of their dresses. Aren't you glad you didn't live back then? Things haven't changed much, have they, at all. The world is still about the superficial, isn't it? I learned it early in grade school on the playground. It's all about the outward, all about appearance, about how much you look and about how much you have. People judge others and are judged not according to their character, but according to their color. Not by their wisdom, but by their wealth. Ours, too, is a culture that judges every book by its cover. And now enters this little Jewish family into the superficial search for the next queen, Mordecai and his young cousin Esther, whom he's raising as his own daughter. As perhaps a thousand young, beautiful virgins are rounded up for the harem from all over the country, all over the uh, uh, the empire, lovely, beautiful Esther, finds herself swept up and carried to the palace. And the last instruction she receives from Mordecai, her surrogate father, is don't tell them what is in your heart. Don't, not, not a word about your faith. She gladly obliges. Not a word about what's on the inside, about who she truly is. Instead, she goes with the flow. And it seems, in fact, that she does more than that. She actually starts paddling. The writer points out to us with double emphasis in verse 7 that the young woman had a beautiful figure. And she was lovely to look at. Esther knew she had it. And judging from the biblical text, she knew how to use it. Reminds me very much of a lovely girl I knew in college who once confided in me during our freshman year, confided in me that her mother's instruction to her on her way out the door was this, since you've got it, flaunt it. During her time of beautification, as if this barn really needed any more painting, she, verse 15, she was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Careful choice of verbs there, huh? So superficial, it was no accident. It was deliberate on her part, like winning the favor of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of the women, according to the Hebrew in verse 9. Uh, Deborah Reed, in her commentary, points out that it can be translated, the Hebrew can be translated here, that she lifted up favor. She is working for this favor. She is pursuing and apprehending it, as she does from everyone, including the king himself. Now, I've got to confess to you, this is not the Esther that I wanted or expected to find upon close examination of this text. I wanted Esther to be the virtuous, unimpeachable girl swept up against her will into a system that victimized her. 
And no doubt, there is a deep, deep ugliness, a violence against women here that not only offends our sensibilities, but violates God's law uh, concerning the care and the protection and the pure brotherly love that all men are always called as men to provide to all women. Ahasuerus here is a perfect specimen of everything that went wrong with the male sex in Genesis 3 in the fall. But Esther isn't exactly covering herself with glory here either. She may be the victim, but she's hardly resisting. In fact, she seems to be plunging headlong into the system with abandon and ultimately right into the pagan king's arms and bed. She knows God's law. She knows it, forbidding fornication and adultery and intermarriage with unbelievers. She knows this is disobedience to God. It, it, it seems like the Bible is actually inviting us to compare and contrast her behavior with her predecessor, Daniel. Remember how Daniel refused the food of the king, but Esther's glad for her portion, in verse 9. Daniel worried not about how he would appear before the king. Esther's glad for the new makeup kit. Daniel everywhere resisted the pagan system and maintained his distinct identity as a servant of the one true God. Esther everywhere accommodates herself to the system, relinquishing, indeed hiding, any distinction of the true faith. Now later on, Esther is going to prove to be Braveheart. But for now, look, to, to the Persian superficial skin-deep perspective, Esther is one beauty, isn't she? Oh my. But how does she look when you look at her through the lenses of Scripture at this point? Well, she's, she's ugly. She's a Christian who has given herself over to the culture. Now, thanks be to God, as I say, in the end it will be righted. She is a heroine, but for now she's disappointing, to say the least. Remember the song, Dare to be a Daniel? Well, nobody's, nobody's at this point is writing, Dare to be an Esther, are they? Yet, God will make something beautiful of Esther by the end of the book, won't he? And this is a good place for us to, to pause and to notice this very carefully. The best saints in the Bible are still a mixture, aren't they? There is some ambiguity in every Christian. In the best of Christians, there remains ambiguity. Sooner or later, every serious Christian has to come to terms with this fact of life. We want, we want unbelievers, all unbelievers, to be dark and corrupt through and through to everyone's view. And and believers to be bright and clean and kind in a way that is just obvious to everybody all the time. It's simply not the case. And I think you know this. Christians can blow it and often do. Big time. And who of us does not look back and find all manner of things that are cringeworthy in our past. The ways we have failed the Lord. The ways we've dishonored the Lord. The ways we've disobeyed the Lord. The ways that we have disappointed the Lord. And swam directly with the current of the culture. 
Here's the wonderful thing. Whatever you have done in the past, you cannot write yourself out of God's script for your future. You can't. God's people like, like Esther or like you or like me with our lackluster pasts, our serious failures, real ugliness, He takes people like us and He makes of them, of us, truly beautiful people in His kingdom. You see, the world has it all backwards, doesn't it? It says to us, the world screams at us. I mean, it, it does this every single day. The world screams at you. It says, make yourself beautiful, doesn't it? Make yourself worthy. Put on your makeup. Get the perfect body. Get riches. Fix yourself up. And then you will be accepted. Right? Then you will be approved. Then you will be married to the culture. And so people run around spending, as my grandson says, gazillions of dollars uh, on makeovers, obsessed with their looks. They become obsessed with their bank accounts, but they can never reach the goal. They can never make themselves good enough, beautiful enough, rich enough. Jesus does exactly the opposite. He says, he wants to marry us. I am the bridegroom, you are the bride, and he comes to us beginning, starting this way. I'm going to make you beautiful. He doesn't say, you make yourself beautiful and I'll receive you. You make yourself worthy and I will receive you. You make yourself desirable. You fix yourself up and then I'll receive you. No, he says, I am marrying you to myself and I will make you beautiful. I will make you worthy. I will make you desirable to myself, to me. And the way he does it is the most remarkable thing of all. He did it by laying down his life for you. He did it by making himself absolutely, not just ugly, hideous. I I mean... He, this is the all-glorious king, mind you, okay? The all-glorious, beautiful king of heaven. He made himself as a homely man. Do you remember the Bible says there was nothing particularly attractive about Jesus? Nothing would have caused us to desire him. And then it only goes downhill from there to suffering for us. He's beaten, he's bludgeoned, he's bloodied, he's bruised. Until he was, says Isaiah, he was marred beyond recognition as a human being. He was marred beyond human semblance. Never was anyone ever made uglier than Jesus became for you and for me. You see, he made himself ugly beyond description to make you beautiful beyond your imagination. And you are, by the way, in his sight. Believe this. You are washed. You are cleansed. You are pure. You are lovely in the sight of your Savior. And a glance at you thrills him. Stop and think about that. Think about it today. Your groom, Jesus, delights over you in the way a prospective husband's heart skips a beat when the back doors of the sanctuary open and he sees his bride, spies her in all her white flowing dress and glory and and beauty and splendor. That's you in the eyes of Jesus. That's how he sees you. That's you in your bridegroom's sight. 
You are beautiful to God, Christian. You are. You believe this. It is absolutely true. He didn't marry you. He didn't marry the church because you're so beautiful. (laughs) He married you to make you beautiful. And he has. Truly beautiful and eternally beautiful. In verse 18, then the king gives a great feast for all of his servants and all of his officials, doesn't he? It's a wedding feast. He has chosen his beautiful Esther for his bride. Esther's feast, it's called. The occasion is marked by remission from taxes and gifts of royal generosity. Well, dear bride of Christ, dear church, I tell you there is coming a great feast that puts every other feast to shame, a feast beyond all feasts. It's the great wedding feast of the Lamb, and you will be there, and I will be there, and everyone who is in Christ, as we talked about earlier this morning, will be there in Christ by faith, will be there after the great judgment when the sheep have been separated from The goats, the latter sent to the ugliest place to die forever at full pitch of their ugliness, and the former gathered to beauty, the beauty of the place, the beauty of the lamb, the beauty of the sheep, and it beggars the imagination and any language I could conjure from this pulpit to convey to you. Persia's best will not even pale by comparison. That is your future. I'm allowed to tell your future when I open the Word of God to do it. That's your future and mine through Christ who prepared us already in this life for that life to come. Let me tell you one more time, you cannot clean yourself up well enough for this feast. Don't even bother. If you've been trying hard to make yourself good enough for God, give it up. It ain't never going to happen. You cannot clean yourself well enough for that great feast, but there is someone who can and who will, and that is Jesus Christ. And to you, who are in him, I say, he has washed you and made you beautiful, and you know how he did it. He washed you by his own blood. His blood has washed you clean. I didn't actively participate in the playground torment of Jenny Palin, but that doesn't excuse me from culpability. My guilt in the matter is just as real. You see, and I I can remember this, even as a little child, my conscience was screaming within me to do something, to do anything to help poor Jenny. Just to come by her side, just to say, just to stop someone from their tormenting. And I said, and I did nothing. I was every bit as superficial as my cruel classmates. That guilt has followed me all my life. So much so that I did an internet search for Jenny to find out how she's doing these 45 years later. Well, she's married. And she's married to a rather homely-looking man. And together they have a bevy of really beautiful adult children. And as for Jenny, let me tell you, she's as homely as ever. (laughs) But not really. You see, with the wisdom of years, I can see now that she is, she's a beautiful person. You know, her genuine beaming smile just overflows out of a heart that loves the Lord, that finds her joy and contentment and satisfaction in Him, in His grace. 
that has bought her in her humble service and grateful to her loving Savior. She is truly beautiful. And let me tell you, if you could see, if, we could, if I could see Jenny today, the way she will appear one day in glory, says C.S. Lewis, we would be tempted to bow down and worship her. You know, the world measures everything in terms of the superficial, doesn't it? Money, looks. Lewis's demonic screw tape observes that prosperity knits a man to the world. He, fi he feels he's finding his place in it when really it's finding its place in him. The brilliant French Jewish, later Christian philosopher Simone Weil observed that a beautiful woman looking at her image in the mirror may very well believe that the image is herself. An ugly woman knows it is not. Praise God, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that you know that your life is not measured by, by prosperity. And the image that you see in the mirror, it's not you. Your treasure is in heaven. And through heaven's eyes, you are more beautiful than you even dare to imagine.